What's up, family? Welcome back to the channel for another conversation. So glad to have you hanging out with me. Um, it's been an incredibly productive week. So glad that it's Friday. Uh, but of course, this is going to be a busy weekend. Um, our oldest has, uh, he's playing in the honor band uh, Saturday in Huntsville. Uh, Saturday night, we have game night on our Discord, um, which I'm thinking about starting to stream those on YouTube. Um, and then Sunday morning, of course, we have Sunday sessions where we're in this uh, conversation called Drive. Um, and I think this Sunday we're going to be talking about too persistent to quit. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. Um, and then Sunday evening, we're having, I believe this is our fifth episode of the ex-pastor call-in show. So Kyle Butler is going to be back with me and we're going to be down to have some conversations, take some calls and just have a wonderful time. Um, all right. I, I think, I think that's pretty much a, a, a good, good intro. What are we talking about today? I want to talk a little bit about why God is obsessed with humans, right? Um, and this is going to be an interesting conversation. We're going to walk through it. So before I jump in it, um, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that alert notification bell, consider connecting, supporting, or joining this community content or channel in any way that makes sense for you. And last but not least, check out the merch and check out our books. We are literally all over the place now and our community is joining like wildfire. So speaking of that, let us know where you're watching from. We want to know where you're supporting us from, because the more the more people we have in an area, the more intentional we can be about investing and in developing actual tangible local community in real life. All right. So. Are y'all ready to jump into this? Uh, now, these notes, I, I warn you in advance, they're going to be a little uh, staggered because these notes are a little bit all over the place. But my thoughts on this subject are a little all over the place. And so um, bear with me. Give me a little grace here. But I think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, when I was in the throes of deconversion, um, I remember having a thought that God seems to be overwhelmingly under concern with any other species on this planet. Like it was a thought, you know, and I was thinking, I was like, damn, like God is really concerned about who people fucking, you know, but like we are highly related to the chimpanzees and he don't give a damn who they fucking, you know, he don't give a damn who the dogs are fucking. He don't give a damn who the cats are fucking. He don't give a damn who the ducks are fucking. And there's a lot of weird things going on with ducks, right? So it was just this kind of slippery slope of a thought. We realized like, man, God really does seem to be obsessed with humans. He doesn't seem to have any concern about animal cruelty, animals killing each other, animals doing all types of other things to each other. But our particular species of animal, God seems to have a strong affinity towards. Uh, so much so, and, and we're in particularly dealing with the biblical God here, this biblical God seems to believe that humans are not animals and that are distinct from animals. This, this God who knows all seems to be sorely subjected to human exceptionalism, you know? And so, and with this thought, a nagging idea that had persisted for years in the back of my head was now finding confirmation that humanity was not created in the image of God, but that God was imagined in the image of humanity. From a highly informed atheist humanist perspective, the portrayal of God in the Bible as being obsessed with humans can be understood as a reflection of human psychology and societal needs rather than evidence of a divine being's actual characteristics. We're going to talk about several reasons why the biblical God appears so focused on humanity. The first one, which is likely one of the most obvious, is the anthropocentrism of human authors. The Bible was written by humans who naturally placed themselves at the center of their narratives. I want to say that part one more time, um, because this is this is a part, at least this first sentence. The Bible was written by humans by far and large. The scholars agree here. Now, there are still people in the faith. And this really shows, you know, my, my concern 
with the faith is that even though by far and large, the majority of biblical scholars understand that this book is developed by human hands, there are still people who sit in the pews who believe that God wrote this book and gave it to humans. You know, and I know it's a yikes, right? But it's a, it's a, it's a true thing. Um, but so the Bible was written by humans. Okay. And so these humans naturally placed themselves at the center of the universe. Um, in, in ancient times, people sought to explain their existence and the world around them by creating a deity obsessed with human affairs. They provided a framework that made sense of their experiences and gave significance to their lives. All right. Um, the portrayal of an all seeing, all powerful God who is deeply concerned with human behavior served as a powerful tool for social regulation. By embedding moral laws and commandments within religious doctrines, leaders could enforce societal norms and ensure cohesion. The idea that God is constantly watching and judging reinforces adherence to these norms. And that's really what you begin to think about. Mm. Because that becomes like a defining, like, like, like a, a defining or even a dividing line, right? Uh, between us and the other species that we share this planet with, you could tell them that, that God is watching them and they wouldn't care because there's a language barrier. You know what I'm saying? There, there's a communication barrier. We can communicate on, on some level, but it's just, it's still very limited. Um, so, so just the idea of a God being obsessed with any other species other than humans would be absolutely mute pointless it would hold no utility in the same way that when humans stop believing in a god it becomes pointless holds no utility oh that was good i like that that but that's that's that defining line god god doesn't care about the animals because the animals don't give a damn about god you know um and more, more appropriately, God doesn't care about animals because God doesn't see itself as a part of that. And God sees itself as something distinct, as a human, you know, at least for, based off of the narrative, this is a humanoid figure, you know, which is how you get it. Like, no, man, we created God in our image, you know. Um, before scientific understanding, uh, attributing natural events to the actions of a deity was a way to explain the unexplainable. A god involved in human affairs could be appealed to for favorable outcomes, such as good harvest or victory in battle. Uh, this divine preoccupation with humans helped people feel a sense of control over their environment through rituals and prayers. Now, the God depicted in the Bible often exhibits uh, human emotions like jealousy and anger and compassion. This anthropomorphism makes the concept of God more relatable and understandable. By attributing human qualities to God, the authors were able to address complex ideas about justice, morality, and existence in a way that resonated with their contemporaries. Now, I'm not actually, I'm not uh, exactly being an Einstein here just by sharing this information. Because this is stuff that we've already known. Like, this is, this is not unknown. This is not mysterious. This is not lost information. This is exactly what we understand about uh, the gods of Greek mythology, about the gods of Roman mythology, about the gods of Af uh, from different African mythological systems. We understand how these gods come into play. But then all of a sudden, when you start talking about Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus, Allah, Buddha, you know, no, not Buddha, uh, Allah, Muhammad, all of a sudden we're confused at how this could have happened. It's, it's mind blowing to me, um, the dissonance. Um, so yeah, so the, the biblical narratives use God's interactions with humans to convey moral lessons and cultural values that are always, always, always reflective of the time periods in which it was written. Uh, as, as of now, there's, no, there's nothing in the biblical God's morality that was ahead of its time. You know, Genghis Khan did a better job at being moral than biblical God did. 
And that's actually not even being facetious. This is this is true. Um, despite his conquering, he had a uh, very liberal, relatively, <laughs> let's do it that way, he had a relatively liberal way of running his stuff. Um, but interestingly enough, the more we study empires, the more we do find shocking information. Um, but that's also because many times the information we found about the empires that we we found through people who were uh, against them. And so we, we consistently have to learn the lesson of historical propaganda. Um, but yeah, so, so, but yeah, so this is good. So the, the, the goal here is to convey moral lessons and cultural values and, and not at any time do, do we see God get it right in advance. You know what I'm saying? Um, which is why many people make the arguments for slavery, make the arguments for the LGBT community, make the arguments, um, well, just, just for dismantling the, the, this patriarchal worldview, um, which has been damaging in so many more ways uh, uh, than one. Because primarily we, we don't understand, I, I, don't, I don't think we've wrestled with uh, the consequences of internalizing uh, other, other people's worldviews and ideas about yourself. And so um, you, you create a world and you say, okay, patriarchy has been running it for, for a while. Um, if, if your approach to this is simplistic, you, you begin to go, men are the problem. And I don't enjoy being in conversations with people who think on such simplistic levels uh, because, again, you don't understand how um, you don't understand how how social consequences actually work. Right. So, yes, you could say that there may have been a time that men were the problem only. Um, but even then, that would that's just an oversimplification to think that men only promote or that only men promote patriarchy is a gross misunderstanding of the world that we live in. Mm. So I, I often push people to recognize that things are people problems. Nope. There are people who view this world this way. There are women who have internalized patriarchy in the same way that there are black people who have internalized racism. You know, so do with that what thou wilt. All right. Um, so stories like the Garden of Eden, the flood, or the Exodus serve as allegories or cautionary tales that reinforce desired behaviors and warn against transitions, uh, transgressions rather. And again, I cannot drive this point home enough. None of God's moral, none of the biblical character known as God Yahweh, whatever you want to call him, none of his morals or cultural values are unique for its time or ahead of its time. And if this God was beyond humanity and could see beyond humanity, then this God would have been capable of leading humanity to a better place. But it has never been uh, God leading humans. It has always been humans leading this image of God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I mean, that's always been what religion is. Humans carry the idols. The idols cannot carry themselves because they don't exist for real. So humans have to carry the idols from place to place. That's why I hide the word in my heart. That's the way that I can carry the idol with me. You know, um, all 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 religion is idol worship. You know, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So, human beings have an inherent desire uh, to find meaning in their lives. You know, a god obsessed with humans suggests that human life has intrinsic value and purpose within uh, a gr grand cosmic plan. This provides comfort, and you know, I always kind of do these things with uh, quotation marks, in the face of mortality and the hardships of life. Now, the reason I do these things with, with quotation marks is because I am on, one of those people who, uh, I, I'd say as a skeptic, my ideology is really to be skeptical of any claim without evidence. And so just because just because something has become popularized, see, because I know that I live in a world where propaganda 
uh, is effective. You know, propaganda works almost like uh, what, what do you call that thing? This thing that gives you uh, pseudo um, placebo. That propaganda works just like a, pl a placebo. You know, for years, America just said, we're number one. We're number one. This propaganda was so effective that people felt like we were number one, so much so that even if you showed them evidence or just start asking the questions like number one in what? Number one compared to what? You know, you start asking these questions and the whole thing kind of falls apart because they have brought into something that was popularized as propaganda. And now they're living off of that placebo effect, which is a lot of what you're getting right now in modern politics. Much of modern politics is popularized propaganda passed off as placebos. Yoink. All right. So, but so the idea that God having a purpose for somebody creating comfort is something that I, I can't agree with that claim. Um, because again, I spent more than two decades actively involved with ministry with people who believed in a God and believed that this God had a cosmic plan and from time to time believed that they understood that plan and then spent the majority of their time in sort of internal torture because they couldn't understand the plan. So no, it, it's only it's only comforting. And even then, I don't know if it would be comforting because of so much that we're learning about our evolution as a species that you really can't assign meaning to somebody else. Meaning has to be internalized. You have to internally determine, decide what you want to do with your time here. You know, that's where that comes. And, and I think, in, I, I think, and th this is hypothesis at best, uh, but I think that that's the only way it's going to give you any comfort as long as it comes from somebody else it's uh, that, that can never be comforting there's always going to be is this what it, first i think the most comforting one of the most comforting feelings for me is coming to the realization that oh no that's nobody else's role not not even your magical sky pimp i choose what I do with my life. It feels like a movie. I choose my fate. You know, oh, that was Smallville. That was Smallville, which of course he didn't choose his fate, but you know, you know how that goes. All right. Uh, and then of course, uh, the societies that produced the Bible were often facing existential threats such as war, exile, and, opp and oppression. Portraying God as deeply invested in their fate offered hope and a sense of uh, special status as a chosen people. Um, which could unite and strength uh, and strengthen the community, you know. So from, from an atheist humanist viewpoint, the biblical God's obsessions with humans is a manifestation of human centered thinking and the psychological, social and cultural needs of the people who wrote and compiled these texts. Um, the character of God functions as a projection of human concerns, serving as a tool to explain the world, enforce social norms and provide a sense of purpose. Um, from this perspective, the attractiveness of the biblical God can indeed be more attributed to the character's human qualities than to the presupposed divinity. This perspective suggests that the concept of God is a projection of idealized human attributes, magnified and perfected, and serves as a reflection of human humanity's aspirations, fears, and moral ideas. Does that make sense? It's that divinity is a projection of the evolution of humanity. And we'll kind of get in this a little more in this conversation. Um, but yeah, this is why God is so human. Divinity is a concept that is largely human. It's a human concept. It comes from the mind of humans. Um, as you read through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and oh, please join us for Bible study with the next pastor. You'll get a lot of this stuff. But you have these monsters throughout much of the Old Testament that eventually become human. You know, because that's the goal is, is the goal at the end of the day is, is human. Um, it, when you think of 
all of the claims of the Bible. It doesn't talk about the animals going to heaven or hell. You know, as a matter of fact, they're just here to be sacrificed whenever they need to be sacrificed. Because the God of this is not really a creator of life, is not the father of life, is not concerned with life. The God here is an anthropomorphism of human ideals at those times. You know? So, all right, so let's talk about it a little more. You have um, you have the, the human traits uh, attributed to God, such as love, anger, jealousy, compassion, and a desire for justice. Um, this makes the deity obviously highly relatable to human beings. By embodying these emotions and behaviors, God becomes a, a character with whom people can identify, understand, and, and, for, and form a personal connection. This relatability enhances the appeal of the deity as individuals can see aspects of themselves and their experiences reflected in the divine. And when we understand these emotions and, and, and how these things uh, go into play uh, for us, then it, it actually becomes impossible for God to have these human emotions without having the human experience. And God is supposed to be so separated from the human experience. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His why his ways are higher than our ways. His ways are so far, his ways are as far from ours as the East is from the West, but yet he gets jealous and he gets angry and he takes vengeance. Those ways don't sound too far away at all, bro. That sound like that's just right around the corner. You know, I, I can go from reading Ross. I can go from reading Rainbow to Rick Ross from nine to five. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, how, how is that any different? I guess we're all very godly after all. And that really is the point. That there really is no godliness outside of humanity. That God is restricted to humanity. God, through his own obsession, through the book, obviously, is relegated to only human affairs. This is further evidence that God is a human construct. Yoink. All right. Okay, so, um, and then of course the concept, so the, con and I, I just said this, so I kind of got ahead of myself, but the concept of divinity can be viewed as an idealization of human virtues and potentials. The biblical God represents an ultimate standard of flawed, but ultimate standard of morality, wisdom, and power, qualities that humans admired and strived toward during the time that this was written. And again, one of the biggest call outs is that God's morals seems to evolve with our morals, but you don't see it in the book because the book is not a living document, which means it is not updated as we learn more. Instead, we just update our interpretation of it and therefore find ways to make God more moral. But because it is not a living document, then because of that, we now have the exact proof that no, God was never moral according to modern standards. God's morality is trapped. Dang, this is good. God's morality is trapped to the time periods of the people who held those as moral standards. God is subjected to the morality of the people who believe in him. This is good stuff. All right. All right. All right. So. Hmm. So from this standpoint, divinity is not an external supernatural essence, but a projection of humanity's highest aspirations. By envisioning a perfect being, people set a benchmark for their own moral and ethical development. Now, here's the other part. Biblical narratives often emphasize the idea of humanity's fall from an original state of grace or perfection, such as the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Right? So this suggests that early writers perceived humans as having degenerated from an ideal condition that we were trying to return to. And I think that's the mind fuck. I think that's the trap because we already know there is that nothing could be further from the truth. And, and let me just get on my high horse for a minute and, and talk about why, why this one to me 
is so so problematic because even when people convert uh, or deconvert, even when people deconstruct, they still hold on to some of the bathwater of these ideals. You know what I'm saying? Um, to the sense of believing that there was a time better behind us than there is right now. And it's just like, nah, bro, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So <clears throat> the mind fuck is you have this idea, idea, idea that at one point humanity was this perfect species. And then we got corrupted, you know, either through sin or through whatever else. And we've, you know, just kind of started falling down the rabbit hole and we got something that we have to get back to in order to be better people. And it's like, no, that's not how the historical timeline of our anthropological or sociological evolution works at all. All right. It was just 200 to three year, 300 years ago when we stopped killing each other on site. Okay. As a species, just, just 100, I mean, uh, two to 300 years ago, when we stopped killing each other on sight. <laughs> yeah. So no, like, um, things have been horrific. Those are the consequences of being, you know, space primates on a floating rock. And, and at this moment, that's what we are. We're space primates. I want to see that movie now. Um, and so we have had a lot of learning to do as a species coming into this world of consciousness, intelligence, sentience, enlightenment, whatever, awakening as a species. It has been a long, tumultuous, rough journey. And in many cases, we stayed, you know, I've got to use some preaching stuff here. In many cases, we stayed in the wilderness too long. But we should definitely understand now that there's for the most part, there's nothing back there that's worth going back to. We, we should only be looking back there for reflection, looking for lessons to learn, not things to return to, you know. Now, that, now that's just me. I, I know some of you are more conservative than that. I'm a progressive and, and I mean it in every sense of the word. I don't believe that we come from a fallen state. I believe that we are currently and have been since the moment we walked out of the caves and climbed out of the trees, that we have been in a moment of rising. We have been in a state of rising. That's why one of the things I say at the end of each of my videos is keep rising. That is the message of evolution in, in my humble opinion. That's that's my gospel. That's the good news. The good news is that you can keep rising. You can keep growing. You can keep striving until, until there's no more breath in you. you. You can keep trying. You can keep doing things. Just keep rising. There isn't a fallen state that I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to see what is all, all what, what, what I'm possible, what, what I'm capable of doing, what is all what all is possible with my life. I'm just trying to rise. There is no ceiling for me. There is no predetermined outcome for me. That is the freedom that in many cases, our obsession with religious superstition has robbed many people of. Yeah. So the depiction of God as a perfect being serves both as a reminder of what was lost and as an embodiment of the virtues to which humanity should aspire. And again, I say that's, that's probably one of the most damaging uh, aspects of religious superstition. All right. Now, and then because then that leads to the belief uh, that humans cannot return to this ideal state without divine intervention. Um, it reinforces the idea of dependency on the deity. However, from a humanist perspective, this can be interpreted as an underestimation of human uh, potential. But yeah, it's like, I think I put that in one of my songs. I never needed your deity. All of this human capacity, when it gets rough, I can pick myself up and, 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 and prevail. By attributing the capacity for moral and personal improvement solely to divine assistance, these narratives overlook the ability of individuals and societies to progress through reason, empathy, and cooperative effort. Now that's the cooperative effort part. That's the reason I build community. Um, we build community, not just so that individuals can feel better. That's important to us too, because we're people centric. Um, but we built community 
because healthy people leads to healthy relationships and healthy relationships lead to healthy outcomes. You get to those healthy outcomes when those healthy relationships shift from just us having a good time to cooperative effort. And actually the series we get out of drive, we're going into called the work, which is going to be talking about the physics of change. Oh, y'all ain't ready for this. All right, let's go. Uh, humanism posits that people are capable of discerning right from wrong and improving their condition through critical thinking, education, and ethical living. And at this moment, that is no longer a hypothesis. This is as concrete of a theory as theory can get because we have at least 12,000, um, 12,025 years of human civilization, uh, sociological evolution as groups. We, we, we've seen what this looks like. As a matter of fact, our ability to cast off the shadows of slavery is because th these things happen through critical thinking, through education and through ethical living, because we realized that we didn't need ancient books to be able to discern right from wrong, but that we can look into the eyes of the people that we're engaging with and know the harm that we're causing. What a beautiful world we're living in. You know? The projection of an idealized God might originally have been a way for societies to codify and promote certain values. Over time, recognizing that these values are human constructs allows for the appreciation that individuals can strive toward these ideals independently. You know, like even if you allow yourself for one moment to engage the thought experiment that as all the evidence suggests that there likely is no God, what if then we thought for a moment, okay, what if there is no God? Then where do all these things come from that we attribute to God? Us, God damn it, you know, except for the stuff that doesn't come from us, you know. But no, purpose, joy, passion, desire, um, happiness, peace, love, patience, grace, mercy, all of these are human constructs. And the moment we stop pretending that there was a God who wrote these out on some divine law book before humans could read, we realize that this, 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 isn't, a this, this isn't a mystery. This isn't an unsolved mystery. We, we already know how these things develop because it's, it's, it's there. It's in the historical record. It's in the way that we engage with each other, you know. All right. So understanding divinity as a reflection of evolved humanity opens the door to re reclaiming human potential without reliance on supernatural beliefs. It suggests that the qualities often ascribed to God, like love, justice, and wisdom, are attainable by humans through personal development and social progress. This perspective encourages empowerment and responsibility, promoting the idea that people can work toward creating a better world through their actions. Um, the character of God serves important cultural and psychological functions uh, by embodying collective ideals and fears. By externalizing these aspects into divine figure, societies use this to navigate complex moral landscapes and address existential questions. Acknowledging that these are human creations leads us to a more grounded approach to ethics and community building. Um, from my perspective, the biblical God's appeal lies largely in the human qualities attributed to the deity, which reflect humanity's deepest desires and highest ideals during the time frames that it was written. The notion of divinity as a projection of evolved humanity suggests that the virtues embodied by God are, in fact, expressions of human imagination and potential. Recognizing this can inspire individuals to pursue personal and societal improvement through natural means, reason, compassion, and collective effort without the need for supernatural existence. This perspective empowers people to believe in their capacity to rise to the standards they have imagined, fostering a sense of agency and res responsibility in shaping their destiny. At the end of the day, it seems that we are only attracted to God because he was designed to be reflective of and attracted to humanity. Our attraction to God is an attraction to our limited ideals of what we perceive as best for humanity. 
However, in our superstition, God has become the greatest obstruction to a better world, not the bridge that we need. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I definitely enjoyed pulling these notes together. Um, these notes have probably been 10 years in the making uh, because this was a conversation, you know, the, the opening thought that was 2014, October. Oh, it was October. It was October. It was October 2014. And so I'm glad I could finally get these thoughts off my mind, <laughs> off my chest and share them with you. I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Don't forget to uh, like the channel, subscribe to the video, hit that alert notification bell. Consider joining, supporting, or connecting with this community channel or content in any way that makes sense for you. And of course, please check out the merch and the books because we have some of the dopest stuff out there. And at this moment, we're all over the place. So check it out. See if you see something that you like. Thank you all for hanging out with me. Until next time, keep rising, stay progressive, and if you can, stay beautiful. I'll holla at you later. I was living my life in the servitude of Misunderstandings of people I loved Giving it all, it was never enough Because of the fall, I could never get up I moved on from their misunderstandings I am no longer standing